Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone and welcome to the April episode of Relo Andy's webinars. In case you are not familiar with the Relo office, this is the Regional English Language Office. based out of Lima, Peru. Uh, Regional English Language Office deals with anything having to do with English language education and teacher education throughout, in this case, uh, the Andes region of South America. So my name is Maggie Steingraber. I am an English language fellow who is based here in Lima. In case you are new to the Relo Andes webinars, uh, the, we, the software we use is Citrix, so I'm sure all of you received an email when you were first invited and then when you confirmed your, your registration from either Citrix or GoToWebinar, that is us. There was a quick download, as you know, so if you can hear this and you're joining us, you did it correctly. So as English teachers, we want to make this webinar for you as interactive as possible. We want you to participate as much as possible whenever you can. So before we begin, I want to go through some of the engagement tools that this platform offers to make sure that you can get the most out of the webinar experience. The first one is the chat box. So first, for what you can see on your screen, is this is your control plan panel. So you, your microphone is muted and it will remain muted for the remainder of the webinar. We cannot hear you, we cannot see you. You can expand or collapse. If this bothers you and you don't want to see it, you can click this orange arrow to either make it go away or to bring it back out. If you have a question throughout the webinar, you can type it into the chat box here Again, throughout the webinar, any questions that come up about the content, feel free to type them in as they come up. We will save questions for the presenter until the very end, but type them in and we will keep record of them. And at the very end of the presentation, we will go back to them. Also, if you're having problems with any technical issues, you can't hear, you can't see, you can type in a question there and we can do our best to to solve the problem. Also throughout the webinar there will be some questions asking you to participate, give some ideas, so type them into the chat box there. So just to make sure that you've all found the chat box and you know how to use it, if you can just type in a quick message that just says hello and where you're joining us from. All right. We have Evelyn in Lima, and Judith says hello, Lisbeth, hello, Marcella, e Evelyn, hello again. <laughs> Rila Mike is here, Charlotte from Bogota, a lot of people from Lima, Colombia, Juan Cayo. All right, excellent. All right, so it looks like you found it. Okay, perfect. So throughout the webinar, if you're asked to type in an idea, if you have any questions, anything comes up, that's where you can type it. Oh, Virginia, Mexico, hello. All right, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Okay, the next tool that we have is hand raising. So this little icon here that looks like a hand with an up arrow is how you raise your hand. So throughout the webinar, this is intended to imitate a classroom where you could raise your hand if you had a question, but since there's so many people joining us, if you raise your hand for a question, we unfortunately probably will not be able to see you. But we will be using this just to take quick polls, so we might ask you to raise your hand for whatever reason. So just to make sure that you've found the hand raising tool, if you could raise your hand, if you can see it, again, that is this tool here. So if you found this, please raise your virtual hand. All right, six of you have found it, seven. All right, 
There we go. Okay. All right. Yep, looks like most of you found it. Perfect. Okay. So the next tool we have is polls. Throughout, throughout the webinar, we'll also be asking you a couple questions. These are multiple choice questions, and you would just answer them. They'll come up on your screen, and you can just click on whichever response is the most appropriate for you. So we'll do an example first. So first off, just so that we know, what is your experience with webinars? Is this your first webinar? Have you done a few webinars in the past, maybe one or two? Have you participated in many webinars? Maybe you've joined us for all or webinars from other presenters? Or are you an expert in this? You've both participated and presented. Click on whichever one is most appropriate for your webinar experience. All right, we got about 62% of you voted, 65. We'll give it a few more seconds. Click on whichever one is most appropriate for you. All right. Give about five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And close it. And as you can see, 16% of you are joining a webinar for the very first time, so welcome. 65% of you have done a few webinars in the past, and 19% of you are experts at this and have participated in many webinars, but no presenters yet. All right, excellent. So the next is handouts. Uh, I don't think we have handouts for this one. We can get hand we, we can make slides available to you at the end if you're interested in receiving any of the materials. And finally, surveys. At the very end of the webinar, just so that we can learn a little bit more about you and for future webinars, know where you're joining us from and how many of there are with you, if you could just please take a quick survey that we have for you just to let us know where you are and how many people you're watching the webinar with. Many people like to watch webinars in viewing parties where they can watch it with their colleagues and share ideas throughout or before or after. So please, at the very end, don't close out the window asking to take a quick survey. It's only two questions and it really helps us in getting to know you better. All right, so for today's webinar, our presenter is Lisa Mann. She is also an English language fellow in Peru, but she is up in the north in Pura. Lisa, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello, Maggie. Hi, Lisa. How are you? I'm good. Very good. I'm excited to give this webinar. All right. I'm excited to get started. Perfect. So can you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself? Where are you from? What are you doing in Peru? Um, well, I, I, when people ask me where I'm from, it, it starts to get a little bit complicated <laughs> because I've, I've been uh, living in lots of different places um, in the last 15 or years or so, but I'm originally from California, from the San Francisco Bay Area, and I am an English language fellow now in Piura in northern Peru, and I work closely with the Universidad de Piura here in this city and with lots of other organizations and people in this region um, doing teacher training, working with students, um, running some professional development workshops and just sort of supporting the English language teaching community um, here in this part of the world. All right, and what is your topic going to be for today for the webinar? Well, today I'm going to talk about um, long-term projects and motivating students through long-term projects. I'm going to share with you all some projects that I've been running with uh, a group of uh, uh, teenage learners here at the Universidad de Pura and talk about choosing projects and, and how great they are for, um, for lots of different reasons. All right. Are you ready to present? I am, yes. Okay. All right. Whenever you're ready. All right. There we go. OK. 
Can you see? Yep. Okay, I can't. I don't have that panel again for whatever reason, but I'll just go without it. Okay, so hello everyone. As you just heard, my name is Lisa Mann and I am an English language fellow in Pura in, in Peru. Um, and today the topic of my webinar is long-term projects. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. You just heard a little bit, but I have a picture of myself and a little more information. So I'm originally from the San Francisco area in California, but I was talking to my husband the other day and we realized that I've actually spent more years outside of California than I ever lived in California. So my connection to my home state is uh, is pretty tenuous, <laughs> getting, getting more so as every day goes by. Um, I earned an MA in teaching English to speakers of other languages from Portland State University in Oregon and another master's degree in translation and localization from Universidad Rovira y Virgili in Tarragona, Catalonia, Spain. Um, so pretty much my whole professional life, I've worked in the field of applied linguistics as an English teacher, a director of studies, a program coordinator, and a translator. And I've worked with all kinds of learners, with, with children and teenagers, with adults in lots of different contexts, uh, teaching business English, uh, lifelong learning, and uh, university. And now I'm, as I said, I'm at the Universidad de Piura in, in northern Peru, which is a, a really interesting part of the world. And you can see uh, this picture of me. This is in the Peruvian highlands a few weeks ago in, near the village of Canchaque. And it is absolutely stunning. If you've never been to this part of the world, I would definitely recommend adding this. Uh, to your list. It's a, a fantastic place to, to visit and, and see it's so naturally beautiful. Okay, so let's just get started. I think probably most of us have used projects in our classes and our courses at some time. And I'm curious to know how many of you regularly include a project component in your teaching. Um, can you just raise your hand if you tend to incorporate projects and long-term projects or short-term projects into your classes? And Maggie, I, don't, I can't see my panel there, so you're going to have to tell me the, um, the percentages. No problem. Uh, we're at about 20% of people have done it before. 20%? 21 Good. now. <laughs> Good, yeah. The projects are, as you know, they're, they're super fun and the students love them and um, I usually, I think most of us usually try to include at least one um, in each course so that uh, take advantage of all of the wonderful things that projects have to offer. Um, so we're still at 21% about? Yeah? So for a lot of you, this information might come as, as no surprise, but I hope maybe during this webinar you get a few new ideas and maybe a spark of inspiration to uh, use some projects and get some new projects going with your uh, groups of learners. So let's see, what I'm going to talk about. Um, first, I'll talk about what makes a good project a good project and not just and not just a project. So let's look at some characteristics of good projects and some things you should consider when you're choosing projects for your classes. And then I'll focus on um, some, uh, some key motivators uh, for learners involved in long-term projects and specifically with the projects that I'm going to share with you today. I'll show you some of the projects I'm using with the group, and these projects are all in relation to Earth Day, which is coming up really soon, uh, I think on the 22nd of April. So Earth Day is a, a, a wonderful uh, topic for discussion in classes all over the world because it's so interesting and so important um, to so many people, and it can really get students uh, talking uh, about change and making a difference in their communities. 
And lastly, I'll look at a simple timeline that I use to run these projects in my classes. All right. So, so most of us have used projects before. Can you just type in the chat box? What do you think are some characteristics of really strong projects? And Maggie, I'm gonna, you're going to have to read those aloud. I don't have the... No, no problem. Uh, if you can, do you have the little daisy icon on your screen that you could click on? That might bring it to... I have okay. to go out of full screen mode okay. here then. So we have students choosing the topics, is what Maria said. Can you see my whole thing? Yep. No. Ah, there it's back. There you go. No, now you're it. back. Okay. Yay! Right. Yes, I'm back. Okay, so now I think I should be able to see... Um, can you see or do you want me to keep reading them on? You better keep reading. So, so, okay, I... Some characteristics are letting the students choose their topic. Ellen and Maria both said that. Uh, yeah, Charlotte good. thinks engaging students and having things related to their lives is important. Maria says giving people mm -hmm. enough working time. Uh-huh. Having good. meaningful topics, another suggestion from Evelyn. All right. Yes, those are all really good ideas, and they overlap, of course, with, with some of the, the ideas I'm going to share with you now. Um, good projects are, you know, students are really motivated by projects, but the first step is to choose the projects for them to work on. Um, so it's, it's important to consider uh, some different factors when you start to look at what projects you can ask your students to choose from. Um, one of the first uh, and most important things is that uh, a well-chosen long-term pro project requires some aspect of critical thinking. So that means that your learners are engaged in higher order thinking. They're not simply compiling information or creating something pretty or showing off their expertise as English speakers, although um, those might obviously have a part in the process. But in a good project, students should be analyzing and examining. They are contemplating and discussing different solutions and looking at issues from a variety of perspectives. So critical thinking is one of the, the most important components of a good project. And you can lead your students to critical thinking by, uh, by posing an essential question. Uh, did any of you attend Teresa Troyer's webinar last month on unit planning. Can you raise your hand if you participated in the last Relo Andy's webinar? Was anybody there? Uh, one person did, it looks like. One person. Two, uh, people. two people. Three. You can see it? Yes, I can see okay. now. All right. yeah, four. Oh, good. Uh, good, we have serial webinar attenders here. That's excellent. Okay, so if you were at uh, Teresa's webinar, then you heard her talk a lot about essential questions. An essential question is basically a thought-provoking question. It's a question that is open-ended, so it doesn't have a single or final or one correct answer. Um, it calls for higher order thinking, like some of the things we just talked about, like anal analysis, inference, evaluation, prediction. Uh, essential questions can't just be answered by recall alone. So it's not just repeating something you've heard or something you've read somewhere else. It's coming up with your own ideas and your own solutions and talking about them with others and evaluating them. And essential questions also give rise to further questions. So they, they aren't in a, in a vacuum. Essential questions relate to lots of different things um, and lots of different other topics. Uh, an essential question also requires some support and justification. So it's not just saying, um, I disagree. It's saying, I disagree um, because, and then giving a rationale or, uh, and, and really backing up your opinions and your thoughts. So a good project requires critical thinking in response to an essential question. And that is all done in collaboration with other learners. So students have to 
give their opinions and listen to the opinions of their peers. They have to make compromises. They have to try to persuade one another. Um, all of this involves sometimes very sophisticated language. Um, so critical thinking and collaboration together create a great platform for really excellent uh, language learning, but also for social skills. Um, the students have to take some responsibility for managing themselves, for allocating tasks, and creating schedules, and making decisions. And depending on the age of your learners, this might be the first time that they've ever had to take on those kinds of, of roles. So your little project that you've made up for your English class to, to do can also become a kind of a, a life lesson for your learners about time management and planning and compromise and interacting with others. Uh, good projects are also authentic. So they have some connection to the real world. They are, use a real world context. They make use of real world processes or tools. And they have some kind of real impact. Um, they might also be connected to your students' own concerns and interests and identities. So an authentic project, uh, it doesn't mean that an authentic project has to be something boring. They can be super creative and fun and still be authentic um, as long as they're connected to the real world in some way. And if your students are really into it, if they're really interested in the topic and in the project, well then that's authentic, that's real. All right. One of the greatest things about projects in the language learning classroom is that they require all of the skills. Um, and this is why I think probably all of us or most of us use these, use projects with our groups because they are so versatile. Um, the students have to speak informally in their groups to plan and execute their projects. They have to do research involving reading comprehension. They have to write reports. They have to formally present their projects and listen to other groups uh, present theirs. So they're using all kinds of skills. Um, linguistic skills and also functional and social skills um, in the pro project process. Now, from the student's perspective, pro the project is all about the goal, right? I mean, the students are all thinking about the finished product and how cool it's going to be. But what they might not realize is that the journey is the destination and that the project is actually the process and not the product. For all of these reasons that we just talked about, they're using all kinds of skills, they're working together in collaboration towards a goal, they're, they're using critical thinking, they're thinking about big open questions, and they're connecting those to the real world. Um, so goal orientation is an important, your project should have a final um, and clear goal. and motivation, and this is what this webinar is about. Um, good long-term project ideas should act as a source of motivation for your learners. They should be engaging and creative, and as you will see in just a minute, uh, they should give students a sense of control over their own learning and ownership of their own production. And lastly, Whenever possible, uh, students should demonstrate what they've learned beyond your classroom. So this could be within their school or the institution you teach at. It could be online or it could be within their town or their city. But a project with a real world product gives students an authentic goal and makes them feel like they're doing something important, like they're making a difference and not just completing another English class activity. Okay, so these eight factors are important to keep in mind when you start uh, thinking about what projects you want your learners to work on. Let's take a poll. And I have here a project idea. In groups, students have to create a poster depicting the storyline of a film they watched in class. 
The posters will then be displayed for everyone to see at their school. So what do you think, considering those eight characteristics that we just talked about, um, what do you think about this idea? Is it a great idea? Is it okay? Or is it a terrible, terrible idea that should be thrown in the garbage? What do you think? Um, let's see if I can see. Ah, oh, yeah, a lot of you think it's a good idea. I see it now, yes. Oh, you're changing your minds? <laughs> All right. All right. We'll give you just a few more seconds to, to decide, to vote. All right. Should I close it out? Yeah. yeah All right. Let's close it out. Mm -hmm. All right. So there, there are our results. 56% of you said it's a very good idea. And 42% said it's an okay idea, but not great. And 3% said this idea has no merit. It shouldn't be used. Well, that's a little bit surprising. I thought that you would agree with me that, oops, what's going on there? Oh. That it's okay, but not great. <laughs> I think that it, hits some of the boxes of those eight criteria I showed you. It has some of those characteristics, but not all of them. So I think it's an okay idea, but not a great idea. Let's, let's take another poll. Now thinking about that same project, so in groups, students have to create a poster depicting the storyline of a film that they watched in class. And then the posters will be displayed at their school for everyone to see. Um, which of this of the criteria, the eight characteristics I showed you before, does this project not meet? Actually, we only in the poll we only have five of the eight. But which of these does it not meet? What is it missing? And what is it lacking to be a really good project? Go ahead and vote. You can vote for more than one. So vote for as many as you think uh, it, it misses. All right. I think everyone's voted now. I'm going to close the poll. You ready? All right, we're closing it down. Good. Oh. So can I see the results here? Ah, yes. OK. So 39% said you think it's missing a critical thinking component. 28% uh, said it doesn't have used multiple skills. 31 authenticity. 14% of you think it's not very motivating, and 75% of you thought it was missing um, the essential question. All right, that's pretty good. Let's take a look at what I, I have in my PowerPoint. I have all of the eight, um, all of the eight possible characteristics. So you were only able to vote for five. So right, the as you said, the this project doesn't have a critical thinking component, right? The learners are asked to simply recall information that they saw in a movie. So they don't have to think very much about it other than working together to maybe remember the sequence of events and maybe decide which of those events are the most important. Um, they are simply reproducing what they saw without any analysis or evaluation. Right? It is collaborative, right? They, they have to work together in a group to do it, so it, it ticks that box. Um, it's not really authentic. And some of you said that you thought it, it, it some of you didn't click the authenticity as, as, a, as one of the characteristics that it doesn't meet. It's not very authentic, authentic because um, graphically re reproducing a story is not really something that we're called upon to do in our lives. And I don't know about you, but I don't tend to make very many posters <laughs> in my free time. So for me, this isn't a, a super authentic uh, 
um, project. It, it, maybe you, you thought it was authentic because it's connected to a movie, but um, just because something exists doesn't make it um, authentic as a project. Right? I say that it's not a very motivating project, at least not for everyone. Um, it may be motivating for some students who are interested in drawing and interested in art, but not for all of them. Um, when I first started teaching, I worked with very young learners, and I remember being shocked that not all kids like to draw. So I thought I would have them draw pictures of, you know, Europe and, <laughs> and color them in, and that was motivating for about a third of the, the class, and the other ones were like, ah, they didn't really care about it. So it might be a hit for some in terms of motivation, but some of the other ones, some of your other students won't be interested in it if they're not interested in drawing or coloring. And as most of you said, this project also does not respond to an essential question. Uh, there's not much to discuss here. There's no higher order thinking going on. So the question it responds to is, is really just what happened in the movie. Right? Uh, it does use multiple skills. Uh, there's listening to the movie. Uh, they have to speak together in groups. Uh, you could easily add a writing component to this project by asking them to summarize the, the film. So uh, it, it has or it could have uh, multiple skills um, uh, that hit that criteria. It has goal orientation. The students have to produce something. They produce a poster, and it has a public product. That poster is going to be displayed in their school. So this project isn't all bad, but it misses the boat on some of the most important criteria for a good and engaging long-term project. For projects that practice skills that go beyond simple language skills, they go into a little bit deeper and helping students become not only good English speakers, but good thinkers and good talkers and good interactors. Yeah? Okay. So let's go back to the idea of motivation. Uh, a good project should be motivating, but what does that mean? Can you just type in the chat box what you think makes a project motivating to learners? Now, what really gets them interested and in wanting to, to do a project and wanting to take part? Can you type that in the chat box? Uh, and I don't know where, but Maggie, can you read some of the answers because I can't see them. Uh, we have Evelyn saying interesting topics is motivating. Yeah, good. Uh, sure. Engaging topics from Marta as well. Uh, Judith, Judith says when propose, uh, letting students propose their own project. Ellen oh, good. says topics that connect, the, connect to their life or an area of their interest. Evelyn, again, something that's related mm -hmm. to their interests. Judith says something that they can take part in. Marcella says something that's interesting for everyone. Uh, okay. when, this, when it involves the students' lives and social issues, and when Excellent. students feel that it can apply to their lives, and when it's fun. Excellent. Good. Uh, those are all good answers. And of course, I am speaking to an experienced group of teachers. Um, your, uh, your answers coincide very closely with mine. So uh, these three uh, factors of motivation that I'm going to talk about now, these are specifically related to the projects that I will share with you in just a minute. But they, they kind of, um, they, they, they're kind of motivating for everybody. Uh, I found not only in my groups of younger learners here at the Universidad de Pura, but also uh, with young adults and adults in lifelong learning situations. These, these factors make projects really motivating. So here we go. The first one, as so many of you said, oops, there, is meaningfulness. So this is what everyone so, so wisely mentioned. Uh, the good projects have, are motivating when they connect in some way to the students' real lives, to their real worlds, and to their realities. Um, they are very personal to your learners. And that personal component acts as a source of intrinsic motivation for them because it makes them feel special and important and that they can make a difference in their own lives and in their own environment. 
So meaningfulness is the key motivator for long-term projects and keeps students interested long, long after the project ends. A second uh, motivating factor is agency. Agency is basically uh, voice and choice. It's uh, allowing your students to decide uh, what they want to work on and to a certain extent how they work on it. This is what someone said about letting them choose their own project. Um, you could certainly um, see that I agree with that as we continue through this webinar. Um, and again, agency is a source of intrinsic motivation. It, get, it gives students a control over their own learning, and it gives them a sense of responsibility. And it often results in really creative products, uh, sometimes much more creative than if you control them uh, step by step. Yeah. So these first two motivators are sources of intrinsic motivation. In other words, they motivate the students because they make them feel good and they make them feel in control and important and smart. Um, this last uh, factor is kind of a mix of intrinsic and extrinsic motivator and it is technology. Let's take another poll for the fun of it. So can you just tell me how much access to technology do your students have? Is it constant? That means you have uh, computers and an internet connection in your classroom. Is it sporadic? That means you have maybe a language lab or a computer lab at your institution, but you maybe have to arrange a date and a time to go there? Or is it non-existent, that your students don't have connection, an internet connection or access to computers while they are with you? So go ahead and, and vote. Let's see what you say. How much access to technology do you and your students have in your current teaching context? And let's see, ah, most of you have a computer lab at your school. And that is actually my situation as well at the moment. Some of you have no computers at your school. Okay. Good, okay, so let's close this. And we see the results. So most of us have Spark, uh access to technology, and that's not unusual at all, that there's a computer lab that you have to arrange to go there on a certain date at a certain time. Um, some of you don't have any uh, technology available at your institution, and for those of you, the projects I'm going to show with you in a minute um, will have to be obviously be adapted to, um, to not include the technological component. Um, I actually, I can imagine my students making some pretty amazing final products even without the technology uh, uh, component of these projects. So um, these ideas will still be interesting to you even though, um, even though you can't use the technology. All right, so let's move on. Yeah, the personal, these, these personalized and meaningful projects with technology, if possible, um, and giving lots of students opportunities to show agency, to choose what they want to do and how they want to do it. Um, these are a huge source of motivation for students, and they create a space from which learning just kind of naturally happens. So I'm going to show you now some of the projects that I've been doing with my groups in relation to Earth Day. Um, so thinking of this idea of agency, of, of voice and choice, I created a project catalog in relation to Earth Day, um, which is, as I said, at the end of this month. And there are lots of different ways you can run this in your classroom, run the project selection process, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But for now, I'll just show you some of the different product, uh, projects I let my students choose from. Hopefully you'll find some ideas you can use with your students or this will inspire you to create your own projects to use with them. So I created four projects just to make it manageable, but obviously you can include as many projects as you want in your catalog. Um, they're all related to the environment in some way. So 
the first, all of these um, project descriptions, these were just what I showed. I showed my students exactly this. Um, it's just a couple of questions to get them thinking, and then just enough information to allow them to make a, an informed decision. Uh, they got more detailed project descriptions um, a little later on. The first project was a wildlife guide um, where they think about the animals and plants and insects they share their uh, environment with. They take photos of those animals and plants and insects, and then they do some research to find out about their habitat and what they eat and how they live, um, and they write a short summary about each one, and then create a website uh, with showing all of their beautiful photos and each with a little file of information about each of the uh, of the animals and plants that they find. And at the end, like all of these projects, they give a presentation um, of their website and of their experiences. So that was the first one. I'm going to show you four. <clears throat> the second one was a social media campaign. And in this project, the, the group decides on one uh, environmental issue in their city or their region that they would like to improve. And then they start a Facebook page, and they have to uh, constantly keep uploading memes that they create and information that they find on the internet. They have to create a challenge. I don't know if you remember, um, I think it was probably last year or maybe a few years ago, there was an ice bucket challenge where people dumped a bucket of cold water on their heads um, to raise awareness about an illness, I think. You can see how well, how well they raised awareness. I can't remember what it was about. And I do remember the challenge. And so the students will create a challenge, something like that, um, for the people in their region. And they'll set, set some goals for citizens to uh, try to solve the environmental issue they've decided on. So they, this is a kind of an ongoing one where they're constantly creating content and um, sharing it with the people and their followers in their region. Again, they create a presentation and show it to the rest of the class at the end of the process. The next one is a newspaper, uh, is a newspaper project where the students go out into the world and act as journalists reporting on environmental crimes or and 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 look at uh, uh, their city for, with, a, from a with a critical eye, um, taking pictures, writing stories, doing interviews, um, summarizing information from other sources uh, to create a professional looking uh, newspaper like this one. Um, this and all of the technology uh, used in these projects is free. This is a free newspaper template site that makes um, really uh, professional looking newspapers. This would be published online or tied in with the social uh, media um, project and published on, in that forum. And the last one uh, ties in with the Why English and Zonk uh, series by uh, the American English uh, people. <laughs> this is a comic book uh, by and for English language learners in Peru. And in this, uh, in this project, the students have to design a comic book or a comic strip with a superhero who has a superpower to uh, solve some of the environmental problems in their town or city. So the, in the comic strip, the, uh, the superhero goes out and into places in their city where they can use uh, landmarks from here and, and solves, uh, solves environmental problems. And in the end, they create an animated slideshow. They can record their voice over, the, um, over each frame so they can record the narrative and the dialogue to make a little movie. This uh, can be shared again with the social media on the social media campaign and also shown in class to their classmates. Okay, so let's take a poll. I presented these four slides that you just saw to a group of 
13 to 15 year old learners in Peru. Now, which one of these projects do you think was the most popular? I, I allowed them to choose whichever one they wanted to work on. Which one do you think they worked on that most of them wanted to work on? Let's see. What do you think? Uh huh. So you're thinking what I thought too. All right. I. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. So you can see, 14% thought that the, the most students would choose the wildlife guy, 37% thought the social media campaign would be the most popular, 2% thought the newspaper would be popular, and 47% thought the comic strip would be the most popular. And you know, before I showed the catalog to my students, I imagined kind of the same, the same thing. I, I thought that that would be the result, but guess what? the most popular project was the wildlife guide uh, by a landslide. Isn't that interesting? They wanted to, um, they, the most of the students wanted to make a wildlife guide. And I think this is, has to do with what happened in class that day. Um, there was, we were he here in our, our classroom in the beautiful uh, UDEP campus, and there was a giant iguana outside our room. And I said, oh, look at that iguana. And they started telling me that it's not called an iguana. Here it's called a Picasso. And they telling me about how it, when it's little, they, they move really quickly. And, and when they get older, they're too big to move fast and that people eat them. So we had this kind of conversation about this animal. And I think um, because of that uh, experience and that sort of lovely little conversation we had that the most of them were feeling kind of good about uh, the wildlife in this region at that time. And so they chose that one. The second most popular was a tie between the social media campaign and the comic strip, and nobody chose the newspaper. Oh, I thought they, somebody would, but nobody thought that was a very interesting one. All right. So. Let's move on to talk about how I ran this project in my class. Now, obviously, you can do whatever you want, <laughs> but this is how I worked it out in my class. So it just sort of built up and built up. It goes like this. We started with an in-class discussion about the environment in general. We, had, we played some games. We listened to a song. We did some free writing with, um, with photo prompts, uh, pictures of some environmental disasters in the world, and finally we had small group discussions about uh, the environment in general and threats to um, the environment in the world. Then we had the project selection uh, process, and we did, we, I did this in that in, I gave each individual a slip of paper and they wrote in, uh, they, they wrote their favorite project, they ranked, ranked the projects from favorite to least favorite with, um, and then handed those back into me so that I could make the groups. Um, that I decided to make the groups because of the specific dynamic of my classroom, but you could certainly allow students to make their own groups if your, your kids are good. <laughs> Um, the, after they were formed into groups, they got together and started discussing how they were going to proceed. And they uh, allocated responsibilities and they started planning what they were going to do and when. Uh, after that was the, is the data collection and content creation phase. Now this is the longest part of the project and I recommend that you uh, include several deadlines within that uh, within that phase so that you can check in and make sure that nobody's leaving everything until the last minute and check in that everyone understands what they're supposed to be doing and everyone's getting involved. Next is the publication stage and because we have sporadic um, uh, technology access here, the, this means we're all going to the computer lab, we're all together going to work on the publication phase together. 
um, they can continue working this on this at home, and they probably will, um, because they are very excited about these projects. I just can't I can't describe to you how excited they are about the prospect of making memes and and taking photos of birds. And I, I I'm I'm really pleased at how well this worked. And lastly, the presentation is on the uh, last day of the process. The students will have to present their final prod product and also talk about their experiences to the rest of the class. And the rest of the class will have to listen and ask questions to them so that they're not sitting there worrying about what they're going to say, but actually paying attention to their peers. OK, so that is the end of my webinar. I hope you found it interesting and that maybe you have been inspired to do some long-term projects with your students. Um, I, of course, did not invent uh, most of this information. <laughs> I relied on the information published by the smart people at these institutions. And the last three links you see here are links to the websites and apps that you will need for the projects that I have just described. So um, thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes to take some questions, right, Maggie? Yes, we do. So the first question came from Claudia. This came a little while ago about how you can encourage students to participate in these types of projects. Well, uh, an important thing is to keep your groups size uh, pretty small. My students were all uh, really interested in participating in all of these because of those motivating factors that I talked about earlier. Um, but you, you want to keep your groups inside in, it, to down to about three or four students. That gives them each uh, a sort of a, a sense of responsibility. Um, if you have a bigger group, uh, that some, some members can just sort of disappear into the background and they don't feel like they, they have to um, have to work on it because some because everyone else is. So uh, keeping a small group size makes everyone a little bit accountable for what happens in the group. Okay, and the next one is from Liliana. It's about when you don't have access to computers and limited technology about making the projects interesting. She notes that a lot of English books tend to have interesting situations in them and wonders what you think about using the textbooks to create interesting projects? Uh, it's kind of two questions, isn't it? Well, the, the first question about um, not having access to technology, as you'll see in, in these projects, and I'm just going to go back, um, the, really it's the last uh, step that uh, requires the technology. And you can certainly do each of these projects without that publication step. Um, you can the newspaper, you can have them draw a newspaper on a, on a giant piece of paper um, or get some newspaper, newspaper paper from a printer and have them make their own that way. So the, I think that you could come up with some really beautiful products actually um, without using the technology. So the social media campaign is, is pretty technology reliant. I, I'll give you that. That <laughs> one you can't really do without technology. But certainly the comics, um, the newspaper, and the wildlife guide um, can be done without technology just by changing and adapting that last step. And, and, and for the textbook, I, I'm a firm believer in using the textbook. I mean, I, I, we, we have to, in many teaching situations, use a textbook. We're, giving, we're given it and we're required to use, to use it. And I think you can adapt a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the activities that are given to you in the textbook so that they become personal and meaningful for your learners. But they often do require some adaptation. And there's a few more questions, but just I wanted to point out quickly that there are a few handouts that are now available on the three different projects, the Superhero, Social Media, and Wildlife Campaign, as well as the PowerPoint slides from Lisa's presentation. So if you'd like to download those now while we're speaking, they are available. We'll leave the webinar open for a few minutes afterwards in case your, your connection's a little slow and you need extra time for downloads. Um, okay, Judith had a question on 
if you have any advice with working with uh, university students who are at intermediate to advanced levels. Um, for, for these projects specifically, I think th these would also work with, um, inter with, with uh, university level students. Um, last term here at the Universidad de Pura, we did a long-term project on um, called the Best of Pura, and this was with two intermediate groups of university students. You can you can Google that Best of Pura, and those websites that come up were made by my students, um, and that was a, a a project to find the best establishments and the best places to go. Um, in this city, which has not got a lot of information about it online. So um, these projects, I, I think the same uh, motivating factors that I mentioned here for younger learners would also uh, be motivating for university students. OK. And Sarita had a question about uh, working with large groups of students if you have a class of, let's say, more than 40. Yeah, if you have a really, really giant class, I would say you probably want to limit the number of different projects that you have going on at once. Um, because in my experience, they need, in the first few days, they need kind of a lot of guidance. There are lots of people asking me questions. Teacher, can I do this? Can I do that? And that agency that I was trying them and, and the freedom to make their choices, um, it, it takes a little while to sink in. So uh, if you can address large groups of learners at the same time, uh, lots of different groups working on the same project, just for your own sanity, it, it, it's, it's easier. So you might want to limit it to two or three different projects that they can choose from and only have a few different ones going on at, at any given time. And a few different people have asked this question about how long you give people to, to do these projects, the timeline. OK, good. That's it. Yeah, the, the timeline is in the, um, in, in the attachments there, but uh, it's about a month. Um, and that just because uh, we don't have, we have a lot of objectives we have to meet. We have a lot of work that we are required to, um, to do in this class. And we are working towards exams that um, are on a fixed date and about uh, 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 have fixed content, so I have to kind of squeeze it in between other things. So my um, my timeline is about a month with project work, uh, deliberate project work, uh, once a week. But I also will, you know, the last 15 minutes on a Friday, say, okay, get into your groups and um, you know, t and work on your project or talk about your project. Or now is the time you can ask me questions about your project. Um, so. A month formally with once a week uh, uh, set aside for project work, but also throwing in 15 minutes here and there when, um, when time permits. OK. And Luciano had a question on any advice for how teachers that work in public schools could include this in their curriculum, in their classes. Um, because of the technology? Uh, I think you know, maybe the technology and also that the curriculum's a little more set. Uh, yeah, my um, my curriculum here, or my my the syllabus that I am required to follow here at UDA has nothing about Earth Day, <laughs> and I'm not saying that you should go on your own and and do what you um, do whatever you want. But I have managed to squeeze this in by sort of um, picking and choosing um, more in mm, the most important elements of what I have to teach and, and really sort of working those things quite intensely so that I have some time for this. So it's really about managing your time and making sure your students are learning the things that they need to learn um, and trying to find the time to squeeze something in on the side. Um, so yeah, it's a, that's a hard one. I know exactly what you mean, but yeah, it's a, uh, trying, as I say, to to find a find a place for it. Okay, we got two more questions. One more, the one of them is from Judith. She wants to know how to adapt these projects into research projects, probably at a university level. Ah, that's a good question. Well, some of them are 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 pretty active, like the social media campaign. Um, 
you know, I would have to <laughs> have to think about that. I don't know if you could adapt that one into a research um, into a research project. They all do have a an element of research because they have the students have to find out information about the environmental issues in their city, and um, and think about uh, solutions and look at some of the solutions that other cities have adopted. Um, so there is an, a research component. I would have to sit down and, and really kind of rework some of them to make them research focused. Uh, certainly the wildlife guide has a big research component because they are just taking a picture of an animal and then finding out all kinds of information about that animal. Um, but yeah, I would have to think. I'd have to think about how to um, change the focus to research rather than to action. Okay, and the last question is from Roger on any advice that you would have for improving pronunciation and fluency through long-term projects. Well, fluency um, fluency comes through through getting lots of opportunities to speak and to practice with your peers and that's one of the beautiful things about these projects is that they are the students are in their groups they're talking about their ideas they're excited about the ideas that they're sharing um, so that it, these projects do improve fluency because they um, they require lots of speaking practice um, for pronunciation they when they go to do their presentations, um, they will will probably get some feedback from me before they uh, before they go on stage uh, and do a little practice run, so I can help them there. But it doesn't really include a huge pronunciation um, uh, component in the project. All right, I think that is about all we have time for for today's webinar, so thank you, Lisa. Thank you. We hope you can join us next month. Uh, we will have another presenter, this time out of El Salvador, Heather Van Fleet. She will be talking about mindsets and motivation. So save the date for Tuesday, May 24th. That is from 3 to 4 p.m. Peru time. Uh, you can connect with us either on Facebook if you want to be sure to join our next webinar or any other events through Relo Andes. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and also all of the webinars are recorded and uploaded to the YouTube channel through the U.S. Embassy in Peru. You can also look through it for look for it through Relo Andes. Uh, you can connect with us through email at reloandes at state.gov. Also, if you have any questions in the confirmation email that you got from the webinar, there is my contact, so you can also reply to that, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. There are a couple handouts, like I mentioned, that are available. In case you need an extra few minutes for download, we will leave it open for another couple minutes, another five minutes. Once we close down the webinar, you can't download them, so make sure to download them now. In case you miss them, once again, you can reply to the email that you got from the webinar, and I'm happy to send them to you. So we hope you can join us next month. Thank you for joining us now. Thank you to Lisa for presenting, and we hope to see you on Tuesday, May 24th. Bye. Goodbye.